welcome everybody uh, who's here for the live session and who's perhaps watching later on the recording. Um, this is an ISAG um, public meeting to discuss the safe return to uh, workplaces and to schools. And this has become very topical um, just today with the decision, the announcement by the government that in uh, from Monday, so two school days time, they're going to stop contact tracing in schools and um, we are going to discuss what that means and the, the wisdom or otherwise of that decision. And so joining me today, we have uh, Professor Anthony Staines from DCU, who is an expert in public health. And we have a guest speaker who is um, architect Orla Hegarty and an assistant professor who's an architect and an assistant professor in UCD. And she has been, uh, we're very, very happy to have Orla with us today because she's been vocal for the last 12 months or more about the importance of air quality and ventilation and all of these other measures to avoid to avoid transmission and therefore be able to have um, a more normal uh, level of activity. Um, she and her expertise has been called upon multiple times within the government. So she was part of an expert group that was reporting to NEFIT and she was in witness for the Eructus Health Committee. So, um, you know, of course, part of the architecture field of architecture is, um, you know, how do you make indoor spaces work well? And that is the challenge of this pandemic with this airborne uh, virus. So we're really delighted that you're able to give us some of your Thank time, you. Orla. Thank you so much. So, but before we get into the meat of the discussion, um, uh, Anthony, I thought maybe you might be able to give us a bit of an update just on the um, the situation on the ground, the case numbers, and this kind of thing based on um, the, the latest data that you have available. Yeah, perhaps I, I could share my screen with you, um, if you could give me permission to do that. Hopefully Claire can do that. I'm sure she's listening. <laughs> can you do it? Maybe just give it a try and see if it works. Yeah, uh, sorry. I'm now trying to find the right screen here. Just <laughs> there you were. I, I have two, too many things open. So you should be able to see a rather large graph confirmed COVID case. Just coming. Rates. Just coming. Just give us a second. And these it's are exactly. smooth. Okay. Hasn't hasn't oh, here. It's a, okay. I can see it now. Yeah. So I I think what's most interesting from the point of view of our discussions today is that rates are generally going down or staying stable in most age groups. They're rising in two age groups. One is in people aged five to 14, yep. where the age groups started rising quite sharply when the schools opened. And th this has been explained in various ways. Um, our interpretation, which seems the obvious one, is that there is an increased spread of infection in children's schools. There are a, a number of ideas being put about this is somehow related to increased testing. But really, the pattern seems too consistent to be associated purely with testing. The other group where case rates are rising is the zero to fours, and the beginning to rise from a very low base in the oldest age groups. In other age groups, they're high, but staying fairly stable. So we, we have pretty much um, rising case numbers in the unvaccinated. Yeah. And it's it's likely that the drug companies will be applying for approval to vaccinate children aged potentially five or and upwards or two and upwards uh, in the next week or so, and that we will be in a position to offer vaccination to primary school aged children uh, at some point, maybe even this side of Christmas. Vaccination in secondary age school children has the uptake has been phenomenal and a, a remarkably high and rising proportion of children have had one dose of vaccine and an increasing number have had two. And I'd be fairly confident that most secondary school children will be vaccinated perhaps by the end of October, if not even sooner, which is obviously, you know, it's brilliant. It's fantastic that has happened. I'm going to share uh, another screen with you. This is slightly worrying. Um, coming. The, uh, what okay, this yeah. is, is um, what they call the, the rate of 
the force of infection, R0 or R. And it, it had been relatively high in the beginning of August. It fell to one and stayed around there. It dipped below one as case numbers went down. It's just gone up to just over one today. And this again is averaged over the last seven days. And in individual days figures are really quite unreliable. The problem about this is that when you look at the both biology and mathematics behind this, it, you're in a situation which can go very quickly in one of two directions. It can go very quickly to low case numbers, which is obviously what we all want, or it can go very quickly to high case numbers, which is, is what we're concerned about. So what happens over the next month or so is gonna make a big difference to our lives really up to Christmas. Cause you know, speaking personally, I would quite like to have something resembling a normal Christmas. Um, and I was asked about this in June of last year, what I thought was going to happen. And I thought that there would be further outbreaks of COVID and we'd be back to normal by about Christmas of this year. And I just hope I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were already more right than most people at that time would have thought. I mean, I think they thought we were back to normal already. I mean, we were so close uh, in June of last year, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we have seen, I think, more than once, unfortunately, that we haven't taken the available steps to, um, to avoid things progressing to a worse uh, situation. So we saw, you, met, you mentioned there, um, you know, some people saying it's higher testing and actually, um, Philip Nolan has been tweeting this evening, and essentially that is what he is saying. He's saying the higher case numbers um, that we are seeing in this primary school age group is actually to do uh, with increased testing in that group and is not a genuine increased incidence. Um, I don't know if you had the chance uh, uh, yeah. to think about that. I, no, I've, re I've read Philip's... Um... Twitter stream, I, I would simply say that Philip's background is that he is a, a muscle physiologist. He's an expert in the muscle of the air, smooth muscle of the airways, which itself is an important subject. He's also one of the better university presidents in Ireland. He, he has had a huge impact in Maynooth and has done a remarkable job there. But he's not, he, he is not an epidemiologist. He has no training in infectious disease and occasionally it shows. And I think this is one of these occasions. So I, I don't think Philip is right. I think the evidence on the whole is against him. Um, but we, you know, we're, we're going to see. I'm hoping that we won't have major, a major outbreak in schools, but certainly the, the case numbers in schools are rising. And if we look, uh, this is the HBSC report. We've had more outbreaks in schools in the last uh, week than in, in most of the previous year. Yeah. And that's really quite worrying. And is the testing... So that says to me that, that there is... A, mm -hmm. But the, uh, the testing, I mean, when we previously had school children attending, there was also testing at that time, extensive mm. testing of contacts. So yes. that would imply those are directly comparable data sets. Yes. You know, School context in, you know, with the uh, alpha variant and school with the delta variant, everything else is similar. It's just the new, more highly infectious variant. And we're seeing a big surge in cases. Yeah, pre suggest. pretty much. And the good news about it is that because most adults are vaccinated, although we have a reasonable number of people in hospital, it's nothing like what it would have been, uh, say, at Christmas. Yeah. The so vaccination has really taken the edge off this in a, in a major way, and it saved a lot of people's lives. But even in highly vaccinated populations, we're seeing across the world significant outbreaks in Israel and in Singapore, for example, now in the United States, the outbreaks are very close to related to the vaccination status at state level. But vaccinated people are still getting infected, still getting sick, and some of them, unfortunately, are still dying. 
So vaccination is, is fantastic and gives you substantial protection, but it does not give you absolute protection. It probably reduces your risk of being infected, though the evidence of that is not 100% clear. It's harder to measure being infected than you might casually think. Mm-hmm. And it also probably reduces your risk of transmission, but probably not by very much. That that's that would be a conservative interpretation of the, the evidence I've seen so far. So we are going to avoid disaster because we are vaccinated, but we're seeing substantial numbers of people falling sick. I was listening to Neil Lynch uh, talking this evening, and Neil is an infectious diseases paediatrician, mm-hmm. uh, which is my former profession before I went to the dark side and joined public health. And she is seeing toddlers who have COVID, who develop long COVID, whose sense of taste and smell is gone and they stop eating. Oh no. And they lose weight, which you know, is, is, is of concern to their parents. So this is not a trivial illness in children. This has gone, this single infection has gone from nowhere to being one of the major causes of death globally. Yeah. and one of the major causes of death in our own country and in every other country in the world. Uh, and that is something that hasn't happened probably since the 1916, 19, 1917, 1919 flu. Yeah. I mean, it is extraordinary when you put it like that. And um, for, um, I, the statistic I heard as well in, uh, in the UK at the moment, there's a thousand people dying a week mm. from this new disease that we had never heard of uh, 18 months ago. Yeah. And um, we have somehow used to that, which is, um, I think is extraordinary. And the idea that it's, uh, you know, that you, you should get, that people are trying to get used to that and say it doesn't matter, I think is um, is, is a really disgrace. Before, um, I, I want to bring in Orla now, um, and I see Ivan Perry is here as well. Great to see you, Ivan. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, both of you, like, you, Anthony and Ivan, as, as public health experts, what do you think the consequences of not contact tracing in primary schools will be? What do you fear will be the consequences? Maybe I'll bring in Ivan first, just to, to bring him in. Yeah, I, I think that um, the, 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 the fear is, is, is that the, this very significant outbreak of, of COVID that, that we are seeing in our, in our schools will be even more extensive because of course that's 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 that's, that's the whole point of of contact tracing it it it, mm. it, it it's to c- c- control the spread of the of, of the the in, in in infection and it's it's really hard to see the the rationale for uh, cur- curtailing uh, contact tracing at this time unless it's it's it's, it's partially driven by staffing and re- resource uh, con- con- constraints, but what I mean, as as we've said, that the basic biology of the 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 the, the, the virus uh, hasn't changed, and it's, we're we're not in Ireland going to escape the consequences for children that 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 that, that have been seen in the UK and in the US and in in and in in, in other countries. Obviously, with our relatively small population where we're, we're, we're not seeing the numbers of children in ICU and, 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 and so on, but, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that, that we're escaping other significant, uh, both short and long-term health effects for, for, for our children from this uncontrolled spread in our schools. So one argument I've heard is that um, there's been a the kind of complaint in a like, if you like, that uh, this contact tracing is um, interfering with children's access to education because it means they're having to go home because they were sitting beside somebody, and and that that contact tracing essentially is more disruptive to their access to education than presumably letting uh, COVID run through the school. I mean, would you have any uh, comment on that, Ivan? Yeah, no, I think that that's really that's a hit, that that is a, a a very strange argument. Contact tracing is is our key tool in in uh, outbreak con- con- control. And why would we not to seek to to take all possible steps to um, minimize the the, the the spread of virus? 
um, have, as, as you, you, you know, uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech have recently, I think they're, they're, they're about to, to get approval for a COVID uh, vaccine in five to 12 year old children. And I'm sure that when that is mooted in Ireland, there'll be lots of concern and hand wringing about the, 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 the risks to children from the vaccine which are likely to be minuscule compared to, to the risks to, 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 to children from the, the uncontrolled spread of, uh, of this, this serious in, 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 in infection in schools. Thanks, Ivan. So now I'd like to bring in Orla Hegarty because, you know, uh, there are alternatives, of course. You know, there, it's not stay at home and miss your education or, you know, uh, go uh, or, you know, come in and have uncontrolled spread. There are alternatives. You have been championing these alternatives uh, for the last year or more. And I think it, it bears repeating um, because it's so important to get this message out. You know, so the, what are the things that we should be doing in our schools to make them safer for the, for the children and to ensure then the stability of the education as best we can? Yeah, I'm really struck by your comment about a thousand people a week dying in 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 the UK. And somebody, uh, I can't remember who it was. Somebody made the point during the week. It's it's like three major plane crashes every week, and and asking people to accept that as being normal in some way. And um, if we were having three major plane crashes a week, we would get all of the experts in aviation, and meteorology, and human behaviour, and everything else around a table. And, and, and we would do what they do in, in aviation um, and, and we would put out alerts and solve the problem and we wouldn't let it happen. Um, we have somehow in the same way been asked to accept that this is normal. Nobody who will be ill with COVID in October is yet infected, nobody. This is a preventable disease. And to, to accept now in September that thousands of people will be infected in, in uh, October that the hospital system will be disrupted, the children will be missing their education, is 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 complacency and 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 laziness to some extent. And um, I was looking at a quote from Florence Nightingale earlier from 1863, where you know she said she says infection is preventable, and it's either it's either ignorance or incompetence if it's allowed to happen. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, I think we need to be much more rigorous. We, we don't have all of the people who know how to prevent this around the table. We are, we are, it's not clear what evidence is driving policy. Um, and, and it's clear that there are many, many strategies that are readily available that we're not using. Um, you know, it's disappointing to see that the, the contact tracing is maybe not working and maybe overloaded and maybe doesn't have capacity and maybe it's not the best use of resources. I don't know, it's, it's not my area. Um, but what wasn't announced today was we know that all of the evidence points towards masking being very effective in schools, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And here's the good reasons for it. There's nobody saying we now realize that we can't have all of our CO2 monitoring in place, you know, for the end of the month, or we, we're going to have a strategy of filtration as they are in many American schools. Um, there is no proactive policy to replace the contact tracing impact on, on lessening disease. And um, I also am concerned when I see the modeling um, that there is no mention of the fact that we are at probably the highest risk time of the year where at the end of September we still have had incredibly mild weather up into this week um, and as soon as the weather gets cold people stop ventilating buildings um, so so Delta has uh, been uh, controlled obviously and managed uh, vaccination has managed to uh, temper the worst effects of it and keep the case numbers fairly flat uh, but we now have had the maximum impact of, of vaccination there's nothing else to squeeze out of it for the time being and if anything some of it will be lost with waning immunity in older people um, uh, and people will have more exposure um, what I find shocking is that in the first uh, from the this time last year uh, in the following 24 days cases uh, went up four times so the case numbers from this week last year to 24 days later was four times higher. 
Um, and that was purely, uh, obviously, seasonal and behavioural factors because nothing else happened. In fact, uh, the pubs and restaurants in Dublin closed, so that dampened things. Maybe it could have been worse. Um, and schools were being ventilated and people were being cold and, and people were going to work and in public transport. Um, so I'm really concerned that that risk hasn't been modelled or mitigated because we don't have anything to, to as a kind of hold back the yeah. tide um and um it just to <laughs> in a long way to get to your question there are many many things that could be done in schools i think um some of it is is information um i still regularly and i heard it all week with people reopening offices talking about sanitation stations and deep yep. cleaning and perspex screens and if you know people taking off their mask as long as they're two meters from other people and um, um plastic screens around desks and things all of things that are um, of limited or no benefit whatsoever that people still think they're doing the right thing so people want to do the right thing but they don't know what it is um i i think public information has been very very confused and mixed um but but i i suppose my my core one for this evening is that in the last week both the world health organization um today and uh, the chief medical officer last week have very clearly said that vaccinations alone are not enough. So something else has to be uh, in tandem with the vaccination program. And either we do that strategically with as minimal impact on getting back to life, or we don't do it, in which case we might we will have a crisis situation. And the current plan is against all of that scientific evidence uh, and says that within the next month, Ireland won't have any parallel preventions. And, and I worry that the, the, the alternative political strategy to not having preventions is this, what I think, immoral and unscientific notion of allowing uh, COVID to spread through children in some strange way that it gives natural immunity. Um, and the idea that we would even consider having protected children for 18 months, that the way to protect children now is to infect them. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so protection from a disease by infecting them with a the disease. And, and there is a very strong political movement internationally that is saying we can shore up our vaccination program in adults by allowing children to develop a natural immunity by infecting them. And, and Ireland seems to be following that path. We're not masking our younger children. We're not putting mitigations in schools. And we're out of step with European countries who are doing a lot to protect children with air quality monitoring, with filtration, with mask policies, um, with uh, spreading out more teachers, using different rooms, uh, very strong environmental pr protections for children and isolation policies. Uh, Spain, France, other places have uh, mandatory, the whole class isolates if there's a child who's ill because they want to break the chains of transmission. They don't want to spread the disease around. Um, so I, I think we need a very clear public debate here about what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, no, and it's um, the, the idea that, um, you know, that is somehow there's not transmission happening in schools. This idea is being spread as well, as if somehow schools have some intrinsic barrier to transmission. So we, it, and, it, and it really doesn't make logical sense. So we know that children catch COVID, that's well document, documented. We know that children transmit COVID, that is also well documented. So given that these things can occur, how, why should they not occur within a schoolroom? And um, so it just, it's just totally illogical to claim that a school classroom is safe if they don't take those other steps. I mean, they can, they can definitely be any space, as you have argued very clearly uh, for a long time, any space can be made significantly safer. Um, but you take it, it, you have to take steps to make that happen. And this, like you said, masks and ventilation and you know, good information so people know what behaviors. And they just have not done those things. And um, there's- uh, But also, I think, sorry to interrupt, I think there's been no, there's been no economic assessment of the cost benefit either, which, which, which is really hard to believe. I mean, my back of an envelope calculation is that air filtration could be in every classroom in primary and secondary um, uh, for, for 10 or 12 million. 
And um, that's low technology and it's widely available. Now, it, it, the combination of, of filtration, that filtration, which is plug-in units and masks will reduce risk in classrooms 90%. That's our school program yeah. guaranteed for the year. It's also protection for every child with asthma. It'll stop flu, it'll stop chicken pox, it'll stop colds, everything else. So children's education and health will be protected. Um, that, that spending was spent on three or four days last week in, in uh, PCR testing. Yeah. Like this is this is a drop in the ocean in terms of the spend on the pandemic. And, and that would pay for itself in weeks. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, if, if what is this? I, I think we need to ask, what is the government's intention here? Because if it was protecting children, why are we not doing these simple things? And um, if it is allowing infection, I think people need to understand what that means. Um, and how many children will have long-term health and education damage from this unknown and, uh, virus? I think there is a claim that it's to protect their education, you know, that it's, that it's unnecessary for them to go home because they're unlikely to be infected because Philip Nolan today said there's a 2 to 3% attack rate, so infection rate in, um, in schools. But um, I know you've been paying close attention to international data, Orla, and... Mm -hmm. um, Ivan and Anthony will have been too, but um, you know, in, we have international data that tells us what happens when you put uh, primary school children together, and you know, we can see that infection happens in schools. Well, we have that Delta case from California, which has been fairly widely reported, um, with a teacher who was um, uh, infected, and uh, she infected. I'm just reading it here. Um, Eighty percent of the front of the classroom were infected by that teacher, and twenty eight percent at the back. Yeah. So I don't think anybody's ever saying that this will happen in every classroom. What we're saying is that if you don't take basic steps, this could happen in any classroom. And uh, and it, 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 ju it just means basic steps. We can make our schools safe. Um, I, I, I was uh, in contact with somebody in San Diego early in the week um, and they've had 10, 000, uh, sorry, 100,000 children back in one school district um, uh, for three weeks now and they've had three outbreaks. Mm -hmm of 100,000 children. And they have been um, implementing a very environmentally focused classroom strategy of filtration and ve ve ventilation and obviously public health supports around that. But they've had three outbreaks and 100,000 kids in three weeks. Um, there is no reason we can't be following these international models. And, and um, uh, you know, I suppose hiding risk or denying risk is not reassuring. We, we need to confront the risk and, and mitigate it. It also could mean then that this would, if we stop monitoring what's going on, so if we stop contact tracing, it means we're no longer um, checking as the, we're not, we're neither breaking the chains of transmission by asking people to isolate, nor are we even observing the transmission occurring. And it presumably then just sneak up on us while our eyes are closed until we have a crisis that nobody can deny. And that is going to be devastating. I mean, we really don't want that. Well, that's, to that's at all. I suppose my risk management, project management hat is that, is that you know, one of the reasons that, that you keep things transparent and you, you keep an awareness and you keep track of things is that you can intervene quickly before things escalate. The problem with not keeping track, uh, and this is the danger with schools, particularly with the weather changing, is that um, this disease spreads invisibly and it spreads quickly. Yeah. So one child on a Monday can be four children on Thursday, can be 16 on Sunday. And before you know it, um, it's very, very hard to, to put a lid on it. And we may, instead of it being overwhelming the contact tracing at the moment, it could be overwhelming the A&E in, mm. in the paediatric hospitals. And that's too late uh, to manage, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I think not tracking it. Uh, and, and we can see what's happened in Scotland. I mean, they, they dropped all precautions in the UK. Um, one, I mean, this is just a phenomenally shocking statistic. One in every... Um, in tw one in 20. 20 one in every 20, of, of all children in Scotland, one in 20 has been um, uh, infected in the last month. Yeah. More than for the entire pandemic up to the last month. And they went back to school a couple of weeks before Ireland. They go back in August. Um, the long, you know, that, that even if a small percentage have long term health impacts, a small percentage of a big number of children is an awful lot of ill health.
and it's a preventable disease. I mean, we have, we, we, um, we rightly uh, get distressed and upset at the idea of disease at all. And just like disease in children is, is really heartbreaking. And if it's a preventable disease, and as you have said, Orla, nobody has caught it COVID in October yet, but we let them catch it in October by, by not taking any steps. There's a question here, which is related to what we're just saying there. So this question uh, says that children and teens who are presenting with post viral syndromes are not being treated or taken seriously. There's no joint of thinking with regard to healthcare for this cohort and parents are not listened to. So it's not, it's not exactly a question, but it is, I mean, like, um, I think it's a, you know, this observation, it seems to be the, a common experience uh, i i mean uh, just to comment on that i mean i i'm fairly active on social media um i i think uh, the denial of risk to children is very very political um nothing gets me the level of abuse and attack um uh, in the same way as discussing health of children um, and it's from people who don't normally tweet about children mm -hmm. um, and don't seem to have any concern about health in other ways it seems to be driven by economics and it seems to be very political and ideological. Um, uh, the scale of reaction to talking about long COVID, to talking about children's health, to talking about masks in children, uh, precautions in school, um, the backlash is, is very, very strong. And um, it's not something that I have seen on social media before. Yeah. So I think people need to be aware of that. There's a very, very strong um, agenda out there to minimize risks to children yeah uh, which is it's hard to explain Anthony I think you wanted to come in here as well yeah very briefly um I another uh person in the audience asked about their concerns about sending their primary school children back to school as the contact tracing has been shut down because they're not vaccinatable yet and the children in question also have some existing health problems which there's great difficulty accessing services. And I suppose the, the message for that is that children do get sick with this disease, but they generally recover. It looks like long COVID in children typically lasts something like three months or a bit more and affects maybe 7% of children. So it could be much worse than it is. Very few children will get seriously ill. A lot can be done by energetic uh, school heads. What, there's a school near us that managed to have no cases of COVID-19 in the last outbreak. And this was done because the head teacher stood outside the school every morning and any child who sniffled sideways was sent home. Um, and it worked. And um, that, that person has, has been in touch about ventilation. I know they're trying to get air filtration in their school. Everybody in the school wears masks. No ifs, ands, buts, or maybes. This is a secondary these, school, I guess. This is, no, it's a primary school. Oh, very good. It, these are all within the scope of, one of the advantages of schools is that the they're independent. So, the Board of Governors of the school can do an awful lot, regardless of what the Department of Education wants. So they have the option, there are options there for schools. They, you know, it is fair to say that the department has given up. I think it's fair to say the Department of Health has given up as well. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the reason that goes into it. We, we know there have been economic evaluations of COVID. There have been three that I know of, uh, one from Australia, two from Australia and one from Italy. And they all say the same thing, which is not surprising, which is that the economic benefit is in controlling cases, not in allowing it to run loose. But our government's ignoring that. So th there are things schools can do. But it, it, it does need central policy change to prevent the potential for something really bad happening in October. We might be looking. No one predicted that the cases in adults would stay as steady as they have. They did, which yeah. is good news. But we are taking a gamble with, with our children. 
And I, I'm not comfortable taking that gamble personally. And no, neither am I. Uh, I wouldn't, and I would never ask anybody to take that gamble. And it kind of reminds me actually of some of the things we heard when um, there was discussion about the MMR vaccine in the past. And, you know, it's, it's healthy to have discussion and to talk about these things. But I heard um, somebody who was then an elected public representative making the comment that it, you were better off having measles than having the vaccine which was an extraordinary comment to make considering um, you know, the number of uh, children who will have long-term health effects and then the number who will also die. You know, it was an, a, a, a criminally ill-informed statement. And um, you know, so uh, it, was an, it was extraordinary. And when people start saying things like that for COVID, it's, I just find it really shocking. And as Orla said, you know, the idea perhaps, you know, there's some quiet idea that's not being fully articulated, but that, um, you know, we are trying to get children to have immunity through infection. It's not even guaranteed that they will become, uh, they will have acquired immunity through infection because um, in your immune system, you have your, your innate immune system and your acquired immune system. And the acquired one is the one that develops long-term memory with antibodies and T cells and things like that. But you have your innate immune system, which can, eliminate an infection before it really uh, even takes hold in your body. So the people who are asymptomatic, they may be having an innate immune response, which has no memory. So, you know, that's very good in the sense that, you know, they didn't get sick, but they are remain as vulnerable as they ever were to reinfection. And we, you know, that could be happening there as well. And, and we don't know. Ivan has his hand up. Ivan. No, I was just just maybe making the very obvious point that Anthony has made is that we 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 we've been who, who relatively lucky so far, uh, but we're, we're we're still only in sep September and we've long months of, of 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 winter to go and and by but by, by not taking the sort of measures that that, that Orla is is recommending in terms of ventilation and filtration, which it's it's astonishing that it could it could be funded for for. 12 million, which seems a, a very small figure, but by, 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 by not taking those measures now, we're, we're reducing our room to, to maneuver if, 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 if things to take it, 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 it turn for the, for the worse in, in the months of, of November and December and, and so on. And, and, we, and, and we certainly cannot um, com complacently as, uh, assume that things will, will, will just gradually peter out. It would be, would be great if, if we could, but with the concerns about waning immunity in 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 the in the, the in the 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 elderly, we 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 just have to we have to pre 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 prepare for the for the um, worst case scenarios, and, and you know take whatever reasonable steps that that we we can take in the sh short term to, yeah. to 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 lower the risk of transmission. It's a fairly obvious point. Yeah. And um, I want to bring in Gabriel Scali if I can. I see he's here. I hope you can, uh, maybe you're able to turn on your, your camera and hear and see us. Gabriel, are you able to? Does it work? No, I, 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 I can't turn on the camera, I'm afraid, but. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? I, I wanted to ask a question of Orla. If I may. Yes, your sound is a little echoey. I'm not sure if that's because you've got um, two devices. Maybe is the sound turned on in both of them? How's about that? Um, so my question, my question for Orla is, uh, is there a legal requirement in Ireland for employers to provide employees with adequate amounts of fresh and or purified air? And, and if there is that requirement, legal requirement, which there is in, in most Western European countries. Why is that law not being enforced? Um, there are ventilation standards for buildings. Um, they're generally, um, uh, I suppose, checked and designed at the time that the building is built. They're frequently not 
um, uh, maintained over time so people don't maintain equipment they don't operate correctly uh, they make changes to buildings they change the windows to put in partitions whatever else um, people block up vents because of drafts and and all sorts of other things happen um, so there are clearly lots of buildings that are what I would call under engineered or over occupied or both uh, so a classroom may have been designed for 20 but it may have 30 and there may not be adequate ventilation for 30 um, a building might be designed for mechanical ventilation uh, but maybe they're operating it on recirculated air to save money or whatever there's lots of reasons um, what I do think is really important and the, the route of health and safety at work legislation in the UK is the same route as in Ireland because it came out of Europe at the time um, and this hasn't been very well articulated with the back to work this week at all. Um, the, the responsibility for safe workplaces is on employers. It's not on people to make decisions about what they personally think is safe for them. Um, the responsibility to risk assess a workplace, uh, whether somebody is working with asbestos or climbing a scaffolding or working in a uh, laboratory um, or in an office, the, the, the employer must do a risk assessment. and. Um, COVID is a biological agent and, and they need to ris assess the risk for that and, and make an adequate response. And part of that would be to assess the ventilation and the air quality in the building and whether staff are provided with PPE and, and all of that that goes with it. Um, and I, I, I don't think people have been told very clearly. There's a lot of radio ads about um, employees uh, going back to work and what they need to do. And, and I haven't heard much about the employ employers uh, that we normally hear at the time the tax returns are due. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think people need to be aware of that. I did hear um, a, a Damien English uh, on radio saying to people to report to the Health and Safety Authority if they have concerns about their workplace. Um, so I think that was quite welcome. I think people need to know that that facility is there. Um, and, and within that law as well, I think people need to be aware that you know employers do have to take on board people who are pregnant or have a health condition in their employment situation so that they're not put at risk and that should be part of this assessment as well yeah yeah and there was so yeah you're, you're mentioning their workplaces which is another topic we did want to cover we've got um about 15 minutes left or so um because we're talking mainly about schools but of course there has been this um uh kind of return to work um uh, document i can't remember the proper name for it now um that was released this week and um you know they were talking about the the responsibilities with some discussion of the responsibilities and having kind of local um gabriel you were talking about this what was this the, the local um health officer or local covid officer kind of thing gabriel you still there or muted yeah, um, local workplace representatives to yeah. be appointed in every single workplace, which I thought was a big step forward. Um, but they obviously do need training and, and good science behind them. And one of the problems with the protocol was that it wasn't very good on, on the airborne nature of transmission. And I, I do worry uh, for employers as well, because mm -hmm. if there is an outbreak traced to a place of work, that has damaged people or maybe ended their lives. Um, the, the, em the employers are at enormous risk, I would have thought, mm. of, of legal action because uh, they may well have failed in their health and safety at work duties. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, firstly, um, if an employer is prosecuted under health and safety, it's a criminal prosecution. Um, and, and the Health and Safety Authority do pursue criminal prosecutions in employment uh, situations. Um, but also there could be a civil litigation where somebody sues them for negligence in the workplace for not doing an adequate risk assessment or not providing PPE or something else. Um, and, and it's kind of surprising to me that the insurance sector haven't got involved here because mostly people, um, employers manage that risk of people being harmed at work by insuring them. Uh, they have employee insurance and um, I haven't seen any clear statement from the insurance sector about whether they will meet any obligation, meet any claims on this or not. Um, so employers, are, yeah, are very vulnerable and, and I, I, it's not, I'm not in any way criticising employers. I don't think they've been maybe given the right supports for them to meet their obligations. As you've already said, Orla, the public information has been um, quite confusing. So there's been this emphasis on hygiene theatre, you know, um, sanitizing your hands like a hundred times. Even when I went to get my vaccine, 
I sanitize my hands at the door, then I sanitize my hands at the bottom of the escalator, then I sanitize my hands at the top of the escalator. And but this was all on instruction, you know, and people who have been standing there, who are standing there and they're, you know, and you just you just do it, right? You're not going to have a discussion at that in that context to say, you know, my hand, like my hands are fine, <laughs> you know, I've sanitized them three times since I got in the door. But this is the message that people have got. It's sanit like um sanitize your hands and sanitize the surfaces. So you're wiping down chairs and tables after using them. And whereas this is always welcome, I am happy to have a clean surface to sit at um, and I am, and I think it's good in general, you know, hand hygiene is good and, you know, that is, that's welcome, but it's excessive. It's probably causing skin damage with all the alcohol uh, uh, sanitizers and it's missing the point. So, um, you know, I, I think there's things that we should say, certain things are good practice in general, hand hygiene is good practice in general, but faced with a specific context, which is an airborne disease where the, um, the major dominant route of infection um, is through infected air, why are we not talking more? Why is not the first thing that is said, you know, look after the air quality, wear a mask, um, you know, get good ventilation, be outdoors if you can, if, you, if you're indoors, make sure it's well ventilated. These should be the things that we're talking about. And so for workplaces, for schools and all of these places, um, everybody agrees we want to be back to normal activity as much as possible. Um, but what there seems to be a lack of agreement on is whether we can um, just pretend there's no problem and go back or whether it's necessary to actually take some steps to make those places uh, safer and so that the opening is sustained and you know they, they, we want our children to get um, a good year of education we do not want to have another disrupted year so we ensure that not by refusing and uh, like by abandoning the contact tracing but by taking steps to make the classrooms safer and and we know how to do it because we know how this disease is transmitted it's it's all very achievable, which is why it's very frustrating. Because by by not tackling it, it is it is leaving an enormous amount of unknown risk there that could blow up at any time. And we know what happens when it blows up and there has to be emergency measures. It's incredibly difficult to manage, and it's very expensive and it's very disruptive to everybody's life. Um, uh, you know, I suppose throughout history, pandemic was managed. Airborne pandemic was managed. Um, th th there is endless amounts of, of uh, documented history of pandemic being suppressed with ventilation. Um, if people, if, if it can't spread, um, it doesn't stop every transmission, obviously, because, but it stops enough to stop the pandemic. Yeah. And the whole point is to keep that, um, that uh, chart of, um, of Anthony's under one. Yeah. Um, it, you can do enough to do that because you take out the high averages of where 10 people are getting infected and you have the cases where one or two are but it's enough to keep or low um you know all through history we have all the evidence of how they did that when they didn't even have the benefit of vaccines and um you know i i i suppose are you, my frustration today is is you know we have had an incredibly successful vaccine program we've had great uptake very clear message very strong public participation um, we haven't had the challenges of some other countries on that, which has been fantastic, and we've had a really good rollout. We can't, the, the idea that we might waste the benefit of that success by not doing some basic strategic supports around the vaccine programme um, in order just to, to fill that gap um, is the idea that we wouldn't do those things is frustrating. And the messaging and the overly positive messaging to people that everything is back to normal now and and the overly positive messaging that vaccination makes you bulletproof yeah. um i think is unhelpful it's it's encouraging people to take risks and um be complacent and and we can't be complacent with this it's still ravaging the world yeah yeah and yeah you're you're, you're so right i think there was i mean we have huge enthusiasm for the vaccine rightly so but then i think um perhaps it's been over egged a bit and it has been like as you're alluding to there somewhat squandered in the sense that these previous pandemics that 
airborne pandemics that were managed were managed without a vaccine. We've so extraordinarily lucky to get a vaccine in such a short space of time that is so effective, and um, that has been you know um, you know the the fruits of a lot of research that would have been going on uh, somewhat in the background until it was suddenly needed. You know these things didn't come out of nowhere as it might appear like you know publicly, but um, so so extraordinary that we had that we should have this thing totally. Um, trampled out by now with the tools we have with the knowledge we have mm. it's just it's just absolutely extraordinary um i see tomas ryan has just joined us uh welcome tomas i i we're, we do you want to uh add in your two cents words before we uh, wrap up fairly soon we can't hear you tomas Thanks, Eva. Obviously, I've missed much of the conversation. Um, I would just say that the lack of resources, which are obviously going to be a limiting factor once you get to a certain amount of cases that you have to investigate, uh, particularly as we're seeing in schools right now, um, is not an excuse for pretending that these things aren't an issue. Um, it is okay for the government, I think, to admit the limit of what our reasonable public health expectations can be with respect to outbreak management. I mean, I don't think anyone is, has unrealistic expectations of that, but I don't think that that is an excuse for, for pretending that these types of, that pretending that it's not important to isolate contacts of, of students, for example, in schools um, and that interpret that this is not an issue. Um, you can either have very crude but effective mitigation measures in place uh, that might include isolating an entire classroom without question if there is a single COVID-19 case in that class, which is, which is how things are done in many parts of the United States right now. Um, or, and that does not require uh, extensive uh, investi case investigation. It does not require uh, anything complicated. But if if we if we simply let it happen as as it's happening, we are going to see a situation where most children are very possibly going to be exposed to the virus. Um, and lack of resources is not. I I just can't see how that is a reasonable excuse for that scenario. Um, just as the, the fact that we're not acknowledging um, airborne transmission adequately in the country due to the duty of care that is obviously placed on custodians of public buildings, including hospitals. We know the virus is airborne. The government are very happy to say people should open windows, but we're not, the government are not, however, happy to give full advice on the airborne nature of the virus because that puts them in a position of responsibility with respect to hospitals, with respect to other public spaces. Um, it's the same kind of rationale with respect to schools that is being applied now, but I think in a much larger scope, which is to, to act like this isn't an issue for children. And it obviously is a significant issue for children. Um, and when we're giving up based on uh, our, our ability to, to properly trace uh, cases that are gr obviously growing, obviously growing based on the last few weeks in schools. Uh, what we're saying is, is that we're effectively giving up. And if we're lucky, that will lead to, uh, I don't wanna say manageable, but a, but, a, but a significant amount of child long COVID and hospitalization. But if we're very, unlucky, it could be much worse than that. And, and I don't think anyone wants that. Um, and irrespective of, of our, our tracing resources. You know, it, uh, we've been making the point already. It's about mitigation. I mean, what, what is so, that I, I, I think it's, it's about why aren't we placing mitigation measures in classrooms? Yeah, yeah. And, and we can do that. And that's the, 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 a prior, the, the prior mitigation measures of uh, masks, of, of, of HEPA filters, uh, of, of more strongly encouraging that symptomatic students stay at home uh, and of contact tracing 
people who are in contact with them, if not whole classrooms. We know that will reduce the spread uh, significantly before vaccination is a reality and vaccination will become a reality in, 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 on the order of months. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think we're having an honest conversation about this at the moment. Thank you, Tomas. Yeah, so um, I, we've, we've been an hour now and I think that's a good amount of time and we've had some uh, good questions and we've had good interaction here. So I think that was just really, uh, really important, uh, important and timely discussion. We see, um, you know, just this week, there's the return to work safely protocol been published. There's the announcement that contact tracing in schools will no longer be taking place. These are, um, and whereas return to work safely uh, uh, protocol document is welcome. Um, it has uh, clear omissions in terms of, uh, there isn't an emphasis on uh, air quality and ventilation. And it's just perplexing the, um, the abandonment of contact tracing in schools is hard to understand um, because we know that we know that transmission occurs in schools. So why are we not trying to um, break that transmission? Especially it's the, the only way we can possibly understand it is a, a resource uh, overload that there's just no capacity, but it's not being presented in that way. It's being presented as being unnecessary as if uh, transmission somehow doesn't occur in schools when we know it does and um, it is not protecting access to education of children to pretend that nothing's happening it's just letting the problem simmer in the background um, until it will affect more and more children so I think that's a that's a negative step and as Orla Hegarty has so wisely and uh, stated and has been arguing for such a long time there are very simple steps we can take to intervene. We do. It is not a choice between um, doing nothing and sending the children home all the time. There are things we can do with the children in the classroom. And as she made the point, um, really, uh, I think a very important point that is worth repeating. She's calculated that with about 10 to 12 million euro, you could put in air filtration units into every classroom in the country which in the context of the kind of money we're spending on our COVID response, that is quite small uh, fry, you know, that's quite a small amount of money. And that would reduce the risk in classrooms by 90%. So I think that- With masks, plus, with masks. With masks, yes, I was gonna say plus yeah. masks. I was just saying, <laughs> yes, with masks, the two things combined are going to, uh, would, would be really powerful to um, break chains of transmission. So these very, very simple interventions that we're not taking, the emphasis has been on hand hygiene. It needs to be on clean air. It needs to be on air hygiene. And that's really the message that has to get through. So I think I'm encouraged by the example of the primary school that Anthony mentioned where they are actually wearing masks and the uh, principal, the head teacher, has uh, you know has asked them to wear masks and has been investigating air filtration. So the independence of our schools is an asset, and um, you know it it should be coming from the Department of Education. That's where this um, this the information and the direction should be coming from there. But there is a possibility for people to uh, maybe take some local control. And I don't know who uh, is listening, who's on their board of their school, or who can talk to their principal. Um, but I think these things, if you want to keep your school open and you want to have an uninterrupted academic year, I think these are the steps to be taking. And it's being done, like it's being done in the universities um, and the secondary school children are wearing masks. It's the primary school children who have neither vaccination nor monitoring now, they don't have tra contact tracing or um, they don't systematically have these interventions to prevent transmission and I think that is uh, that's a scandal and it shouldn't be allowed to proceed like that so um thank you uh, Anthony thank you especially to our guest speaker Orla Hegarty it's really always wonderful to thank have you. your contributions and thank you to the audience for listening we hope you found this useful and informative thanks thank you very much thank you